Hello and welcome back to the Introduction to English Linguistics. We're at session 5, staying with the topic of morphology, and today I'll be talking about morphological productivity and words in the mental lexicon. Before we go into that, let me briefly recapitulate uh, what I said about word formation processes last time. Word formation processes are those processes that let speakers of English create new words that then enter the English language. We talked about compounding, things like skyscraper and blackbird, affixation, putting bases uh, together with affixes, prefixes, or suffixes, uh, prefixes like uncool, suffixes like goodness, conversion, uh, think of the Calvin and Hobbes cartoon verbing weirds language, Clipping, that's your Aunt Sue or your linguistics prof. Backformation is um, referring to, say, something that was televised uh, because it was on television. Acronomy, um, you know, UNESCO, NASA, laser. And then blending, I'm sure you remember the chickadile picture that I showed you. Okay. With this in mind, let's move on to the main question one for today. Today there are several main questions. And the first main question is, what is morphological productivity? Morphological productivity, that's a central uh, issue, central phenomenon uh, when discussing word formation processes because it refers to, well, the output of a word formation process. How productive is it? How many words does it generate? For the purposes of this class, I'll define the productivity of word formation processes as something that is cognitive, something that has to do with speakers' minds and brains, with their um, cognitive competence of language use. So I'll define it as the degree of cognitive ease with which speakers can produce or process new complex words on the basis of a word formation process. Think of, say, the suffix ness. How easy is it for me, cognitively speaking, to produce a new complex word with ness or to process a new complex word with ness that somebody else is saying? Okay, that is our measure of productivity. We'll flesh this out in more detail. Um, to illustrate it a little more, uh, consider these suffixes that I have on this slide here. Um, on the top of the slide you have ness <coughs> and li. Ness giving you nouns like goodness, sweetness, fitness, and li giving you adverbs such as swiftly, softly, harshly. And these two suffixes are quite productive in English. They're very productive. Um, so if you ask your best friend or, or someone at the bus stop, please, could you give me a list of words ending in ness that you can come up uh, within the next two minutes? They will give you quite a number of words, okay? The list will be substantial. Contrast that with the list that someone might give you if you ask them, okay, <clears throat> how many words ending in some or al? can you come up with in two minutes? So some words like wholesome, cumbersome, or uh, words ending in L, withdrawal, rebuttal. The lists will be considerably shorter. And you might say, well, that's simply because in English there are so and so many words ending in ness, and so and so many words ending in li, but there are only very few ending in some and in L, and so it's harder to think of them on, from the top of your head. Right. Right, that's of course a valid point, but <clears throat> um, it's also easier for someone to make up new words ending in ness and in li and be understood as compared to making up new words ending in some or in al and making themselves understood. Uh, let me give you an example. Say you have a friend whose name is George. And George has a very characteristic way of doing things. He acts, you might say, with a certain amount of Georgeness. You know, everything he does has this Georgeness to him. Or 
he's while <clears throat> doing his thing, and you might say, ah, that's you know that's classic George. He is ever so Georgely. So Georgeness, Georgely, those are okay words, and you know, people recognize they're new, but they also recognize what you intend them to be. Um, if you compare, say, Georgely to uh, George some, that was a very George some way of doing this. Ah, uh, that doesn't qu work quite as well. Yeah. Um, so, besides the question, how many words there are with this, uh, with these suffixes, it's also about the ease with which speakers can create new complex words. Taking this into account, we can uh, flesh out our definition of morphological productivity a bit and say that an affix like ness is productive if it occurs with very many bases. Um, so there are many words with ness. This, by the way, is called the type frequency of an affix. If an affix has a high type frequency, well, that's one criterion for it being productive. Um, second, an affix is productive if it can easily be used with new bases to form new words. That's the Georgeness idea. And then third, and we'll get to that in a minute, an affix is productive if it has few restrictions that would prevent coinages with new bases. And there are different types of restrictions. We'll, we'll get to the semantic, structural, phonological. We'll talk about it. Right. Uh, one more thing about productivity that I want to add is that uh, there are at least two different views of morphology. You could view morphology as something that is gradient, so that affixes are slightly more or slightly less productive or somewhere in the middle. Or you could say that, no, 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 productivity is something that either is there or is not there. So an affix is productive or it's unproductive. It's an either-or thing. Now in this class we'll adopt a gradual view rather than an either-or view, but I just want to make you aware that there are linguists championing an either-or view, and on such a strict either-or definition of productivity um, you would state that an affix is only ever productive if it reflects a rule that has no exceptions. A rule that applies all the time. Uh, such as, for instance, a verb taking the present tense third person singular suffix s, yeah, giving you goes from go, walks from walk, and even if you have a word that you've made up on the spot, like spinch, say spinch is a verb that means holding your one nostril closed for a long period of time. Um, well, you could say something like he spinches or he spinched or he's spinching all the time, that old spincher. Um, well, on this definition, on the strict definition, there are only very few morphemes that would be seen as productive, namely inflectional morphemes. You remember inflectional morphemes from two videos past. Uh, most derivational morphemes have some restrictions. So they apply often, but not all the time. And if an affix can be used often, but not all the time, then on the strict definition, it would not be productive. On the gradient definition, it would be not as productive. All right. Uh, consider the prefix un as an example. Un uh, gives you negative adjectives like unhappy and unfit that mean the opposite of what their base means. And, um, well, you can use them in a good number of cases, but then again, sometimes you can't. Okay, um, say you have in your apartment this green carpet and you've had it for 12 years and the color makes you sick. Okay, you want to get rid of it and you need a new carpet, you don't care what color it is as long as it's not green. And you go into the shop and tell the clerk, give me something ungreen. And they will go, what are you talking about? So ungreen is not a word of English. For some reason, 
ungreen doesn't work. And I invite you to think about why ungreen would not be a proper word of English. Right. Um, in our class, then, productivity is seen as something that's gradient. Affixes can be more or less productive. Some affixes being highly productive, things like ER, baker, printer, uh, shocker, uh, ness, goodness, greatness, able, um, skypeable, kissable, whatnot, uh, lee, friendly, george lee, uh, un, uncool, unfriendly, and so on and so forth. Right. Uh, other affixes are nearly unproductive, so that it becomes very hard, almost impossible, to form new coinages with them. Um, a classic example is the nominalizing th, uh, giving you warmth from warm, um, breadth from broad, uh, width from wide, but not green from green. Um, also, dumb gives you kingdom, but not wormdom. Um, ment gives you judgment, punishment, and so on and so forth, but it does not give you emailment. Um, en gives you blacken, redden, whiten, uh, but it doesn't give you greenen. Again, what's this thing about green? It doesn't seem to work. Right, so productivity is gradient. It's um, something of more or less rather than something of either or. Now, given the fact that we've said productivity is gradient, how then can we tell whether one affix is more productive than another one? I've suggested one thing earlier, namely approaching people at bus stops and uh, asking them to produce lists of words uh, in a limited time frame. But many measures of productivity in linguistic research actually work on the basis of large text collections, so-called corpora. You can think of these as a library or a large bookshelf uh, with lots and lots of different texts that are digitized. So you can have them on your computer and you can search through them via something that resembles a, a Google search site. A bit more sophisticated, but essentially it's that. So you can have these large corpora and check, first of all, how many formations with a certain suffix there are. That's again the type frequency. How many words ending in ness are in my corpus. And then second, uh, you can also find out how many of these formations occur only once. Okay? These things that occur only once in your corpus, they are called hapax legomena. And why would these forms that occur only once say something about um, productivity? Well, think again of ness and of Georgeness in particular. If somebody says a word like Georgeness, how often do you think it will occur? Well, probably just once at first. So if you find lots and lots of forms that occur only once, that is evidence that speakers feel free to play around with the form and create new coinages as they go along. So that's why hapax legomena are so important for productivity research. Here's a picture of a corpus that you can actually access online free of charge. It's the BNC, the British National Corpus. That's a famous uh, corpus. It contains 100 million words. Uh, it was compiled in the late 20th century. And it's available via this website. And you can enter little searches there. You see here I entered star and then esque, giving me words like picturesque, romanesque, grotesque, and so on and so forth. Um, and you see, well, there are not that many of them. At any rate, fewer types than with a suffix like ness. Okay, um, type frequency. That deserves a slide of its own. An important measure that is related to productivity is the type frequency of an affix. How many different forms do we find with a given affix? I've uh, done this for the uh, suffix en <clears throat> that gives you blacken and whiten. And in the British National Corpus, 100 million words, uh, en has a type frequency of 44. That's not much. 
So you have widen, weaken, tighten, soften, broaden, lessen, loosen, and so on and so forth. It has a type frequency of 44, and you see that it has only one hapax legomenon, Madden. Yeah. So on the basis of this, low type frequency, low ratio of hapax legomena, you can say that, well, EN, that really is not a productive word formation process. By contrast, um, the Li suffix that gives you adverbs like um, particularly or certainly, that has a huge type frequency in the thousands, and uh, not seen on this table, there are many, many hapexes occurring with this word formation process. So, in conclusion, Li is a highly productive word formation process. Now, I promised to say something about restrictions on productivity. There are different types of restrictions. Um, first of all, uh, if a certain word formation does not work, sounds funny, or is rejected by native speakers, um, there are several different factors that might explain it. Um, for one thing, there might be pragmatic restrictions. Pragmatic restrictions meaning that the meaning of the new formation does not make any sense. Uh, you cannot, for instance, unmurder someone. Or you cannot say the onlyest book I ever read. Well, the only book that already says this. And um, you cannot really disgrow broccoli in your garden. Uh, you can grow it, but you can't make a plant become smaller and smaller and smaller and turn into a seed. No. Those are pragmatic restrictions. Words have to make sense. Uh, they have to have some communicative purpose in order to be used. Pragmatic restrictions. Second, and these are a little more interesting from a linguistic point of view, there are structural uh, restrictions. So the affix um, only works with bases that have a certain structural kind. <clears throat> so um, I've mentioned the L suffix in withdrawal and uh, rebuttal. Here are a few more examples. Arrive gives you arrival, betray gives you betrayal, deny gives you denial. Um, now interestingly, answerol doesn't work, statal doesn't work. And you might think, why is that? I mean, deny means to say something that's not the case and state says uh, that you say that something is the case. Why is denial okay and statal is not okay? Well, the answer simply is that there are certain constraints on the phonological shape that the base has to have. So with O, the base has to be bisyllabic, it has to have two syllables, and it needs to have final stress, like arrive, or betray, deny. Answer has initial stress, so it doesn't work. Answer all doesn't work. Um, if we think of this uh, blacken, fatten, toughen, widen, lessen, the en suffix, um, <clears throat> We uh, might think, well, all of these are monosyllabic, yeah, black and fat, tough, wide, less. So let's see if all monosyllabic uh, adjectives work. They don't. Finen makes something more fine, doesn't work. Dullen makes something more dull, doesn't work. Highen, lowen, no, nah, doesn't work. So monosyllabic seems to be a criterion, but not the only one. Now, what distinguishes uh, black, fat, tough, wide, less from fine, dull, high, and low is that uh, the first row, these end in, a, in an obstruent, okay? Uh, K, T, F, D, and S. <clears throat> Whereas fine has a nasal dull has a lateral, high has a vowel, low has a vowel. So these don't work because of phonological criteria. Um, validin, hilarious, and expensive, and 
they don't work because, well, their base is not monosyllabic. Okay, so these are structural restrictions, more specifically phonological restrictions. <clears throat> Restrict the occasions where you can use a certain affix. Then there are lexical restrictions. Um, lexical restrictions apply when the formation, the new formation, means something for which there already is a very frequent word in the English language. So, stealer doesn't work because there already is a word, thief, that denotes what a stealer would refer to. Goodest doesn't work because, well, there's best. Seeable doesn't work because there's visible. Uh, intelligentness doesn't work because there's intelligence. This is called blocking. Okay, so the frequent uh, word thief blocks the formation of stealer. That's the metaphor. Okay, so we have lexical restrictions. Then um, semantic restrictions apply when the affix only works with bases of a certain kind, a certain semantic kind. Um, here I've given you the example of the e uh, nominalizing suffix, giving you employee from employ, interviewee from interview, trainee from train. And then, well, two examples that don't work so well, namely et, someone who is eaten, or peely, something that is being peeled. Now it seems here that the uh, e nominalization works only with bases that refer to a sentient human being, okay? And um, sentient human beings are not peeled that often or eaten that often. Um, now, given the right context, the right tongue-in-cheek situation, I guess you could get away with these formations, but not in isolation uh, as it is here. Okay, semantic restrictions. Well, that was the first main question for today. What is morphological productivity? And uh, we're moving on to the second main question, namely, what is the mental lexicon? Well, the mental lexicon is the part of your language competence that acts as the storage for all the words that you know. So, in a way, what is the mental lexicon? Uh, this question could be rephrased as, what does it mean to know a word? Well, what does it mean to know a word? Okay, um, in order to use a word and to understand a word, speakers have to know a number of things. So, speakers have to know about the sounds that occur in the word and their order. Here I've given you uh, phonetic transcriptions of the word nuclear which um, some people pronounce as nucula. Um, speakers also have to know about their, the meaning of a word. Uh, so nuclear, that means okay, radioactive in some way. Um, speakers have to know how a given word combines with affixes. So for instance, you know that the word walk is a verb that takes affixes such as uh, s, walks, ing, walking, and so on and so forth. And then um, speakers know how a word combines with other words, how it fits as a building block into phrases and sentences. So the word apple can be preceded by a determiner, an apple. It can um, <clears throat> be preceded by adjectives, as in a red apple, and so on and so forth. Okay, all of these things you have to know when you know a word. <clears throat> um, saying that there is this mental lexicon would suggest that a mental lexicon, uh, though the part of your language competence, is somehow like a book, like a dictionary. 
And there indeed are similarities between a dictionary and the mental lexicon, but there are also important differences. So what the dictionary and the mental lexicon have in common is that both store information on word sounds, word spelling, word meaning, and the syntactic category of a word. Those are things that you can look up in a dictionary and those are things that you know. Um, however, there are also important differences between a lexicon and the mental lexicon. So in a dictionary, words are organized alphabetically, whereas in the brain, words are organized um, by association. Okay. Um, there are stroke patients who lose some of their language capabilities, but there hasn't ever been a stroke patient's stroke patient who has lost uh, his or her knowledge of all the words ending in F, okay, or beginning in F, sorry. Um, a dictionary stores mainly single words, okay, all the entries are for single words. The mental lexicon, by contrast, also stores many word combinations, idioms, frequent phrases, um, like requests, um, could you open the door, things like this. Um, the dictionary stores base forms, so uh, it stores cat, but not cats, because that's obvious, um, whereas the mental lexicon stores both base forms and inflected forms, so both cat and cats are uh, inscribed into your mental lexicon. Um, it's worth dwelling a little on this question of base forms and inflected forms and how they are stored. Um, so you could pose the question, do people remember all word forms as I just claimed they did? So do they store horse and horses, barn and barns, or don't they do it like the dictionary and economize by remembering only morphemes? So you uh, take into your dictionary horse, you take into your dictionary barn, and then you take into your knowledge of language the rule that, okay, there's something like a plural S that you can attach to horse, barn, frog, cat, car, computer, and so on and so forth. That would be much more economical, right? Well. Um, for remembering all the words, you need a lot of memory, more memory than when you just remember the component parts. And um, this is a cost, you might say, but it comes with a certain benefit, namely, you can retrieve items fast and directly. Yeah, so you can hear the word cats, and you don't have to go, okay, that's cat plus the plural, so it's several cats. You can just understand it directly. If you remember only the morphemes, the second, more economical uh, solution, you would have fewer mental representations. Um, <clears throat> you would have the ability to reconstruct the meanings of new words. Um, so, say you hear the word hovercraft for the same time, for the first time, and uh, <clears throat> you hear it in the shape of hovercrafts. You could say, okay, um, there are several of these hovering things, and one of them must be called a hovercraft. Um, the downside of remembering only morphemes and not all words is that retrieval may be slower as you have to assemble words or disassemble words if you process them. So you have decomposition during comprehension, hovercrafts, okay, it's S in hovercraft and composition during production. So I want to say something about several cats. I have to retrieve cat from memory, I have to retrieve the plural s from memory and put them together. Yeah. Now, um, it turns out that people actually do both. Yeah, They uh, both remember um, complex words and bases together with their affixes. And uh, when they process and produce language, they use both 
routes. This has been called the dual route model and it states that in understanding complex words two processes are at work at the same time and they are competing. Uh, there's the whole word route and the decomposition route. <clears throat> and each incoming complex word, each word that you hear, hovercrafts, cats, whatnot, is processed simultaneously by these two routes and the faster one wins the race. The faster one um, feeds into your process of understanding what's being said. So say that you hear a word such as insane. <clears throat> There's the whole word route where you process insane as one and there is the decomposition route which would lead you to parse sane into the, uh, the base sane and a prefix in. And you can see how well decomposition makes the decomposition route somewhat slower than the whole word route. If you can just have one step, one cognitive step, that's faster than having a series of cognitive steps. Okay, now which route wins when you hear a complex word? Um, which words are complex are processed by the whole word route and which are processed by the decomposition route? Um, okay, there's research that has addressed this issue and the finding is that complex words uh, that are more frequent than their components they are processed by the whole word route. Um, consider for instance the word incomprehensible. Incomprehensible, um, I've searched for this word in a corpus that's called time corpus. Um, there it occurs 333 times so it's more frequent than its base comprehensible. This would be evidence that incomprehensible is faster accessed than uh, in plus comprehensible. Yeah, so the whole word route wins. Conversely, words that are processed by the decomposition route are complex words that are less frequent than their component parts. So, for instance, illiberal in the time corpus occurs 31 times, liberal as an adjective occurs uh, close to 10,000 times. So here it's rather more likely that if you hear illiberal and you go, okay, it's, it's liberal but prefixed by ill, so illiberal. Decomposition route. Right. Um, for the dual route model, if you're thinking about it on, on the bus home, um, I would like to suggest a principle that helps you decide whether a word is to be processed by the whole word route or the decomposition route, and that's what I call the small supermarket principle. Here you see two products, namely uh, toothpaste and anchovy paste, and uh, only one of these you can get in a kiosk or a small supermarket. Think of the small co-op at the train station. Um, if you can buy a compound product in a small supermarket, then it's likely processed by the whole word route. Toothpaste is likely to be processed as a whole word, whereas anchovy paste is likely processed by the decomposition route. So anchovy paste, that's some kind of paste involving anchovies. In summary then, um, in this video I talked about morphological productivity and the mental lexicon and uh, I uh, argued that an affix is productive if it occurs with very, very many bases, it has a high type frequency, if a corpus contains many hapax legomena um, formations with it, so that is a high ratio of forms that occur only once. And thirdly, if there are few restrictions on new formations, and we saw different types of um, formations, pragmatic restrictions, does the form make sense? Does its meaning make sense? Phonological, does it have the right phonological shape um, for the affix? Lexical, 
are there frequent lexical forms blocking the new formation and semantic restrictions is the base of the right semantic kind for the affix the mental lexicon then contains information on a word's sound meaning its morphological combinatorics its syntactic combinatorics how it fits into phrases and sentences I talked about differences between the mental lexicon and an ordinary dictionary and I talked about the dual route model all right um, with all this in mind I leave you uh, until next week see you then